Are you talking shift? We are. It's time for the We're Talking Shift podcast. Now, now, now. Here to talk shift, Lori Bischoff. We're talking shift. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast where all we do is talk shift because when we feel stuck or when we're ready to level up, we have to shift. And I believe that process begins with our thinking. A shift in our outer world starts with a shift in our inner world. And that, my friends, is the antidote to feeling stuck. Today, on episode number 53 of We're Talking Shift, I am going to be talking with spiritual life coach and the author of the new best-selling book, From Grief to Acceptance, Misty Thompson. Misty became aware of her spiritual gifts after the disappearance and death of her sister in 1993. So we're going to hear about what happened and how that led to the inspiration of her new best-selling book. And Actually, you guys, I am really excited to share this with you because it's a way of looking at grief from a really different perspective than what you've probably become accustomed to hearing or maybe even experiencing. So let's bring her on. Misty, welcome to We're Talking Shift. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. I'm so happy that you're able to spend this time with me today. Um, I know you've been um, really busy doing a book tour, so uh, so thank you for the time. Greatly appreciate it. Of course. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So so I I read your book, and mm-hmm. I, I have to say I was kind of delighted. That seems like a weird word to use when we're talking about grief, but, but I was kind yeah, of delighted. I get it. Yeah, right. I know you do. Um, yeah. But, you know, because the, the whole take on death and grieving, the way that you write about it in your process, it, it resembles so closely the ways in which I and my sister went through the grieving process when we lost our mother a few years ago. And, right. you know, it, it just wasn't what I expected, that process, based on what I had been led to believe was what a person goes through when they lose someone so incredibly near and dear to them. So, you know, I, I kept wondering, well, when are all those common stages I've been hearing about, you know, uh, to mm-hmm. of, of grieving, uh, when are they going to sweep over me? But really, um, except for one that's not really one of those stages, they never really did. So. Yeah. Anyway, that, that yeah, I was very intrigued, and, and I'm really excited to share what, what your experience and, and your process yeah. with everyone. Right. Well, yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. So, like you said, I lost my sister in 1993. She was missing for 55 days. And during that time, I was getting messages, I guess you could say. I had never experienced it before. I would be in bed getting ready to sleep, and all of a sudden, I would in my mind, I would have this conversation with my sister. The only thing is it felt so real. She was there and I would feel different things. Like somebody would sit on my bed and I could feel the movement of my bed, but there was nobody there. Um, Mm. Things in my room were starting to move, things like that. She was trying to get my attention. There is no doubt. I kept Mm -hmm. ignoring it because I was afraid. I was scared. Sure. Now, was this when you still didn't know where she was? This was still while she had just disappeared and you didn't know? Okay. That's correct. Yeah, she was still missing. We didn't know what had happened. We didn't know anything. My mom knew that mother's intuition knew that there was something very, very wrong. Uh And local law enforcement really just said, oh, that's Stephanie. That's her ways. Because my sister had some run-ins with the law and she was a partier. But still, she deserved to be looked for, and they kind of just took it, and whatever, she's just doing her thing. But my mom knew in her heart there was something wrong. And when I started experiencing those things, it scared me. But at the same time, once I opened up to it, it was really amazing because we had such a great conversation. And I know, like you said, it sounds a little out of the ordinary when it's something so traumatic, but it really, truly was. I felt so um, amazed and grateful that she came to me. Mm-hmm. And it really wasn't until we were um, talking to a private investigator in the Phoenix, Arizona area. And what he said, you know, he had a list of questions to see if he could actually help my mom. And so he was asking some questions. One of the questions that he asked on the like the intake was, has anyone in your family been spiritually contacted? 
And when he said that, I got shivers all up and down my body because I was there with my mom. And my mom really believed me at that point. She kind of did before. People in my family believed it because they just thought I was stressed out, worried. So Mm -hmm. that totally shifted me right there. That, and then I, I would really have never expected. Up. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I I would imagine I I would not mm-hmm. have expected that question to be on a law right. enforcement form. That's Absolutely. wild. I I totally agree. And he had a really in depth perspective on death, and that really helped me as well. You know, he explained that there's the three parts of the of the being: it's mind, body, and spirit. And in order for someone to die. Those three elements need to all transition. So the body will die. The the mind will die. And the spirit will go on to whatever it is that the spirit does. Yeah. And so, so this is the detective? Done, uh, yeah, he was a private investigator. And he'd worked oh years in law enforcement. And it was so inspiring because that really allowed me to be validated that I wasn't crazy yeah. and he had just experienced so much of these stories throughout all of these investigations of missing people that he's been through and you know just murder investigations those kinds of things that he, that's what was coming I guess several people had the same experiences oh that and must have one, meant so mm-hmm. much to you Misty to hear that oh it it truly did. It, it allowed me to not be afraid. I mean, I still was a little, but not as much. And I was really able to open up and have a deep conversation with my sister. And we did. And it totally transformed my life. I totally mm-hmm. changed the way I thought of things. Because at that moment, we forgave each other for anything that we had done to each other. And we did a lot, you know, siblings, 18 months apart, we did a lot to each other growing up. Mm-hmm. And we forgave each other. And it was at that moment I knew that she was going to be okay. It, she had told me she was going to be okay. I knew she was going to be okay. I knew she was going to be found. I didn't know when, but she told me not to worry. And the investigation is not important that we don't, that don't focus on that. Focus on forgiveness and love. She told me all of these things during that time. And it totally changed the way I thought about it. I didn't stress out about her being found anymore. I I stressed out for my mom's anguish yeah, and, yeah. and stress, of course, but I knew she was going to be found. And I knew that whatever happened to her, it didn't matter anymore. She did. Yeah. Die, I feel like she dealt, she died of violent death. She wouldn't go into that with me. All she kept saying is you need to forgive. You need to love. You need to trust, you know, those things. Yeah. Um, and I helped her cross over to the spiritual side because she was able to get her message through to oh, me and I right. would just spread it to my family. And she helps me on my spiritual path because I recognize that I am able to connect to spirit when I'm ready and want to. Um, mm-hmm. And I can help people that way. So that it is was at that just, moment I felt oh, close to her. Yeah. Yeah. That is so beautiful. And it's so fascinating to me that you, so really because you, that is kind of a going rogue story. I'm just going to say right there because you well, have yeah. to, <laughs> right? That's, I mean, so you true. had to really <laughs> shift your, um, your, mm-hmm. what you would allow yourself to be willing to do, you know, with yes. accepting that this is a possibility that she's communicating mm-hmm. with me and, and accepting right. that maybe, you know, there is something else beyond what I thought before and different than what I thought before. So it sounds like you really had to shift your mindset in order to, you know, receive this and, and embrace Absolutely. it. I did for sure. Uh, you know, and, and it was a, it was 1993. So there wasn't a lot of, especially in my small town, you know, we didn't have access, you know, we didn't have internet then. So there was no worldwide access to information on these Mm -hmm. things. We didn't have a bookstore here. We didn't have any of that. So I couldn't research anything. Um, The people in my life was like, okay, that's great, but let's not talk about it anymore. You know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it, it was a total change. And I totally changed the perspective that I had on my sister's death. 
For yeah, sure. yeah. So then, obviously, through the through this um, communication you had with her before her mm-hmm. body was even found, you already yes. knew. Then, I mean, you you knew mm-hmm. that she wasn't yes. coming oh, yeah. back in physical form, right? Oh yeah, I knew that. I knew that as yeah, sure as I'm talking to you, she was not coming back in the physical form. She was gone, um, and I knew her spirit was going to be with me and my family. I knew that. Um, and in a way, you know, we, as we grew older, we kind of grew apart. So physically I wasn't used to having her around anyways, which is kind of, you know, a Mm -hmm. blessing in disguise, I guess that helped with my grief because I wasn't around her physically, but Mm -hmm. I really feel at that moment, we transformed our relationship to something that's higher than what I could have ever imagined. And I feel like I'm closer to her now than I've ever been. In, in the physical time that she was here on earth. Wow, I have chills, and that's just so beautiful. That's, that's funny, just, so do I, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess that's how we, we know it's the, it's the real thing, right? That's yes, what I absolutely. That's, that's what absolutely. I think, yeah. <laughs> So that's so interesting. Okay, so most of us have heard of the Elizabeth mm-hmm. Kubler-Ross five-stage grief model, which is, you know, based off of her work with terminally ill patients. Um Yes. And the stages that she outlines, which are um, denial and anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, which I actually mm-hmm. never experienced any of those. Um, oh, right. Yeah. I, not yeah. I'm looking at them and I'm trying to think back. I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't recall experiencing any of those things um, much. Right. Maybe there was there was maybe a, a teeny bit of anger at one point, very briefly, mm-hmm. but more at myself, not at you right. know, not at my mom for mm-hmm. leaving, but more at me right. or God uh, for taking her. Right, it, right. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't about that. It was more about me. Like I, you know, we we're so arrogant as humans. We think that maybe the power was in our mm-hmm. hands to do something, you know, better and prevent this. Right. Um, but. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but so my question was going to be, are, did you, because you had already had all this communication with her, did you mm-hmm. go through any of those stages then, or did that completely shift, um, right. you know, your process? Yes. You know, I did experience some of those things, but like you, it was a little bit different than what you know, and, you know, I used to work at the federal prison and we were, t- we had some training on something about death. It was a psychology training and they talked a little bit about that. And I didn't experience any of those really like how they taught us or how it was supposed to come about. Like you said, a little bit of anger for you. I had mm-hmm. anger mm-hmm. and, and this might be something that Some people would understand. Some people totally will not understand. But I was angry that she is now in heaven with God and I am still on earth because it's a hard life down there. So you were jealous. (laughs) I was jealous of it. I was angry about it. I was Um, like, are you kidding me? I was the good kid. I did right. And now uh I'm here on earth. But, you know, that was at the beginning. And I began to realize that's because there's work here I need to do. Yeah. And um and I can be guided with my sister. My sister has such a greater perspective where mm-hmm. she's at and she can guide me. But um and I did experience a little bit of anger. Um again, not not just with that, but because I was angry that my mom had to go through this, the loss yes. of a child in in the way that she did. That broke my heart. I was a little angry about that. Yeah. But it wasn't really I didn't do any bargaining. I didn't yeah, it was Mm -hmm. You know, I talk a little bit about it in the book, but it wasn't the way that it's been outlined (laughs) at all. Right, right. And it would be at different moments. Sometimes I would be laughing. Like, I don't just that I don't know what just start laughing. And I think that was just part of it. And in there, it doesn't talk about uncontrollable laughter, you know. (laughs) Yeah, I'm just like this is this has got to be a joke, you know. That right. my family's going through this. This is like in a movie, everything right. that we went through, you know. But um, yeah, so it's totally yeah. different. Yeah, totally yeah. different. I didn't really experience all that. Right, and, and which is so unusual, you know, given us even more so the the tragic nature of what you guys went right. through. Um, yes, yeah. but uh, okay, so so you created. Um, mm-hmm the process 
called The Five Encouraging Phases of Grief. And yes. obviously this was all inspired, you know, over the course of time, starting with this whole situation that you absolutely. went through with your sister, right? Um, That's absolutely true. Yes. Oh, okay. So we're going to talk about those. Um, Perfect. Wh- what would you... Okay, so let's do this. Um, Mm -hmm. You can uh, either, in whichever order you want to, tell Mm -hmm. us what is the main, what do you think is the main difference between your processes, Mm -hmm. your five encouraging phases, and the Kugler-Ross model? And are there any areas that cross over at all? Right, sure. Well, I, I feel like with mine, and I'm not saying you're not going to experience all of those other ones, Sure. But they're such heavy and dark emotions. Yeah. And yes, you may go through it, but I feel like whatever you put out, like you were saying at the beginning, you know, that your outer world mm-hmm. cre- or your inner world creates your outer world. Yeah. So if you're focused on, oh my gosh, I have to, I'm going through depression. Oh my gosh, I'm going through anger. I'm, you know, all of these things, it's so heavy that you begin to focus on those. So, um, yeah, you might go through them, but let's look at um, things that are lighter and more positive. And that's why I came up with the five encouraging phases. And these were all inspired by my connections with my sister. Some of these she had told me at different times throughout my life. Sometimes I didn't get it right at first, but I finally did. And, um, yeah, so it's so important that we really look and focus on these. Yeah, I I think so too mm-hmm. because you're right. When you focus on other, especially when it's been kind of you've been sort of trained in a way by mm-hmm. you know the way that that your society um, manages grief, and so you, you just kind of get trained that that's what you have to do in you yeah. know is grieve in this traditional way. And like you said, the more you focus and dwell on that, then naturally you're gonna you're going to create the emotions that correspond with those thoughts and that focus. Exactly. Um, exactly. So, yeah. So I love your, uh, your five encouraging phases mm-hmm. because it is, it's, it's lighter and it doesn't, it doesn't mean like you said that we're not going to experience some of those other things, but we can also choose s- the five things that you talk about and yeah. hopefully, you know, give ourselves an opportunity for much less suffering and much greater understanding. Right. Exactly. So I totally yeah. agree. Yes. Yeah. So your first one mm-hmm. is, is mm-hmm. love. Tell me about that. Yes. Yes. You know, that's, to me, that's the most important thing. And it's not just love, the physical human love. It is the soul connection love of everything because love is the heart of, of everything as you You heard part of that thing Mm -hmm. before, but love Mm -hmm. is really what is important because we are all connected to some higher source. I believe, Mm -hmm. you know, most of us believe that I believe that. So I know that there's a higher connection and love is what brings it all together. And what, what shows um, that we are, and we can work together. Um, And, you know, it doesn't, and like I said, it's just the, the respecting and kindness. And for me, that's what love is. It's choosing love over fear because you can't have fear in your heart and still have love um, because love is our connection to source. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to remember. Um, And, you know, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So for somebody that's, that's just lost a a loved one and you know, they're, they're on this emotional roller coaster and, and we're saying choose love, um, which I think is wonderful and definitely Mm -hmm. a a good thing to choose where for somebody that's confused though, where do they direct that when you, when we say choose Mm -hmm. love and and, yeah, where do we direct it? Sure. Um, well, what I would do is, you know, direct it towards, your loved ones and direct it to what they want for you in your life. First of all, direct it to um, the love of yourself, the love of God and the love that there is so much more to life than this physical sense that Mm -hmm. we will see our loved ones again. We are connected with our loved ones right now. And I think 
if people would just remember to think about what their loved ones would want for them. Okay. Um, and, and just focus on that part of the love part, you know, like, because our yeah. loved ones want us, they love us so unconditionally. And when they reach that transitional state, they're able to really project that more if we allow it. But when we have heavy, dark emotions, it blocks it. Yes. And, um, and, and I'm not saying it's easy. It's really not easy. I know this. I've been through it. I know. But um, it's something to work towards. And it's something to, you know, strive for. It totally. It will help. Yeah, it will help your grief process. Um, and But it won't ever go away. But it will help you manage your grief better yes. if you just take the time to incorporate the love. And, again, not just the human love. The love, the soul connection love, Mm -hmm. however that shows up for you. Yeah, yeah. So, for example, if somebody is really just, like, sinking Mm -hmm. into the depths of despair, if, you know, going through just practicing and trying and uh, the exercise of just continually shifting focus and thoughts over to loving thoughts, loving things about their loved one, about what they would want for you, that type of Mm -hmm. thing. Okay. Absolutely. And and it might just be um it might it will take a while. It's a process. It's not going to yeah. happen overnight. It's a process. And I think that's what happens. People get so um impatient and they want to control how it's going to work out for them that they don't allow it to happen. It blocks the flow. Mm-hmm. And it might take some people it might take a month. Some people it might take 10 years, you know, but yeah. just focusing just a little bit every day. And, you know, people can do that by just journaling their feelings down and thinking about the love of their loved ones that passed. And if they could write a letter to them, what would they say? You know, it could be anything mm-hmm. like that. Just changing your thoughts to a loving thing that your loved one did for you yeah, um, or what I they agree. would want for you. Yeah. Just right. anything, uh, meditation, prayer, mm-hmm. Um, any of those things. Yeah, I did. I did that too. I, I did a little bit of writing, but for me, yeah. the easiest thing would be to just ha- like literally out loud when nobody was around. I'm just, I would just mm-hmm. talk to her. I would just talk to her. Oh and have yeah, conversation, absolutely. You know, which I still do yes. now, four years later. Um, yeah, so I do that, too. Yeah. 26 years later, I still do that to myself. Yeah, yeah for so sure. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so the second um, mm-hmm. encouraging phase is choosing vulnerability. So explain what you mean yes. by that. Yeah, yes. So being vulnerable, I know when I was younger, I was always taught to, you know, hide my feelings. I was yeah. always told, you have tender feelings. You know, you need to stop crying. or Because I was very empathic. I didn't realize mm-hmm. that at the time. I didn't know what that was, you know, when I was I did a young kid. Yeah. But I would just start being sad for no reason. And I think it was because people around me and I was absorbing their emotions. And sometimes mm-hmm. I would cry. Sometimes it was because I was watching a show and I would tear up or whatever. And I would always be told, just, you know, stop crying. Quit being a baby. Mm-hmm. That kind of mm-hmm. thing. So we learned. It was a bad to, thing. And, yeah, it's a bad thing. And it's really not a bad thing. Now, yeah. granted, we can't be hysterical at the grocery store, you know, but, <laughs> right. but, you know, which I have done. I mean, I've been hysterical in some places and it probably didn't turn out very well, but, you know, right. <laughs> you know, so we try to manage to it, though. Anymore. try to manage it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Do your best to manage it. And yeah. if you feel you need to excuse yourself and go into a bedroom or a room in the evening and just cry then do it. It's okay to do that. If you need to be alone and go for a walk and just cheer up, I do it. You know, I've, I've experienced loss recently and it's more loss of a relationship. My divorce was just final, like three days ago. Mm. That was a hard day for me. It was a very hard day. Um, And what I did is I just had compassion for myself and I allowed myself to cry. I made sure that I was alone. You know, like I, I live alone yeah. now because like I said, I went through a divorce, but um, yeah. my kids, my older kids come and you know, my grandkids come, but I made sure that I took the time and I just said, Hey, I need this time to myself. And yeah. that's what I did. I gave myself the opportunity to cry that's, and it was okay. 
Yeah, and I think that's a really good point to make is mm-hmm. that th- these five encouraging phases of grief um, don't just apply to the death of a loved one. I mean, we can right, grieve sure. over a, over any kind of loss that was something meaningful in our life, like you say, a relationship, of course. Yes, absolutely, yeah. yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that's definitely, so the main thing is just be true to your feelings. Right. It doesn't mean you are your feelings. And this is my clients. I've had to tell them when they say, gosh, I'm so sad. And I'm like, no, you are not sad. Because, mm-hmm. you know, when you say I am sad, you take on that as your soul. Yeah. And that's who you are. As you your personality. Right. Your personality. Exactly. You are not that. You are oh. just experiencing sadness. You're feeling sadness. And yeah. that's part things. of the human. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Two totally different things. And it makes a huge difference because when we tell ourselves, I am sad, I am sad, I am grieving, I am grieving, then guess what? The Mm -hmm. mind is like, okay, you're grieving. And then you continue, you stay stuck in that. Sure. Um, It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So yes, rather, yeah. So rather than I am sad, which is like, this is Mm -hmm. my new role. It's uh, you're saying, you know, make sure that you are putting it into the perspective of I feel sad. It's about the feeling, not exactly. not the state Absolutely. of your in being. Absolutely. And, and you yeah. know, and with that, it, it will, like we all know our emotions are up and down. So as quickly as that emotion came on, it will leave. I mean, because that's just part of the process. You know, mm-hmm. we have joy. We have moments of joy. And then it it goes away and then we have feelings of sadness or whatever, and that goes away. So, I mean, it's just a cycle and it's just something, a phase, you know, the the sadness will come, let it flow and then it will go and then you Mm. can just move on and and go on. So, Mm. but if you hold it in, it's not, it's just going to stay there. Right. And it will come out somehow, some way. Yeah, that's and maybe it. at a very inappropriate time sometimes. When, Absolutely. That's, right. That was the hysterical part, yeah, because I <laughs> yeah. held it in. I held it in and held it in, yeah. Got so it. that's not, yeah. So that's okay. what I mean by vulnerability. Got it. That makes sense. All right, the third mm-hmm. one is choosing compassion. Yes, and, you know, I spoke a little bit about that with the mm-hmm. vulnerability. It's being compassionate for yourself. And, you know, in the book, I talk about compassion over judgment, because when you choose compassion, you're less likely to judge, whether it's yourself, other people, you know, or your loved ones. And that was a huge thing I learned from my sister, because her lifestyle was totally different than mine. And I judged it. Mm. But I have realized now, I needed to show more compassion to her and her situation. And, you know, whatever she was going through, I know she was making her choices, but instead of judging it, just show compassion for, for the person. Um, and that's, and that could be for anybody, but, you know, and then in my sense too, it's compassion towards yourself. You know, I was showing compassion towards myself the other day when I was experiencing my emotions, you Mm -hmm. know, from my divorce being final. And it's, so that's, what's important is being compassionate to yourself and allowing yourself to have that time that you need to grieve. Um, Mm -hmm. And again, it's going to come up and down and there's going to be some days you're doing great. Some days you're going to be okay. Some days mm, not so well, but you know, you push through, but you honor yourself. And Mm -hmm. if, yeah, just be compassionate, have some time to yourself. You know, I always recommend sea salt baths, Epsom salt baths, you know, light a candle, think about them, you know, you use your journal, write, just write all your emotions down. Um, and then ask yourself why, you know, and just see what comes out. It doesn't, nobody has to see it. You can burn it when you're done if you want. Mm-hmm. But all of that is showing compassion towards yourself. Nice. I like that. And you know what? That makes me yeah. think too. We have to make sure that we're showing compassion toward the other, you know, members of the family or the friends that mm-hmm. are that are grieving in a way that's maybe different than ours. If we don't yes. agree with it, uh, we have to be compassionate about their own process Absolutely. toward them. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Everybody grieves differently and that's just it. It's just allowing them to be and grieve the way they need to. 
Yeah. And it, you may not understand it and that's okay. It's not your grief. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. their grief that they're working through and just sending them love, that love I talked about at first, sending them just the energy of love and the energy of compassion will help you because what you put out, you will get back. Mm-hmm. So um, it's just so important yeah. to follow that. Yeah, I love that. The next one is choosing forgiveness. That's a yes. big one. That's a really big thing. Oh, my gosh. Thing, right? That is a huge one, a huge one. Um, and I have learned with my sister, of course, too, that with her it was so much easier. It, it was so much easier with somebody who was who had passed away, and you would think it would be difficult because I couldn't talk to her, but I was talking to her in my mind, and I was able to resolve the forgiveness. But just – Forgiveness for my sister's ex-husband who told police that he was the last person to see her alive. And my question always was, well, if how do you know you were the last person to see her alive unless you were the first person to see her dead? So, you know, it, it was hard, but I learned to forgive him. Okay. So we always thought he had something to do with it. So, you know, I had to forgive him. And mm-hmm. I had to forgive, you know, people who are judging my connection with my sister now. You know, I have to forgive them and um, not have any bad feelings. So for me, it's harder in a way to forgive those who are alive because it's hard to get your message across all the time. Right. There's, I guess it, you so just have there's, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a lot. There's just uh, different mm-hmm. beliefs and like you said ego and yes. uh, what people right. decide is is right and not right mm-hmm. and that would be yeah. uh that would be very difficult and I can only imagine how much of a stretch he would have had to have made to forgive her. Hu- Do you say yes. husband or ex-husband? Ex-husband, yeah. yeah. Ex-husband. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah, it was that, really it was really difficult, but she had told me she made it very clear that I needed to forgive. So uh-huh. I, I, and that was after her. So I knew what she was talking about mm-hmm. um, and it was difficult, but I did. And then other people in my life, you know, not holding that grudge because that heavy, heavy negative emotion is what brings you down. And mm-hmm. it's not always, you know, it's not good because it just, when you focus on that heaviness and you put that out there, it just comes back to you. And yeah. then you have the resentment. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. And and then it's just you just keep spiraling down from there. Yes, when absolutely. It's, it's kind of like quicksand. It's hard to get out. Um, yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So, you know, one of the things before we move on to the last one yeah. um, that mm-hmm. I that I think is interesting, I think it was literally on about the last page of the book. You said it's mm-hmm. helpful to have a clear understanding about what forgiveness means to you written down. And I thought that was really interesting mm-hmm. because it's easy to talk about forgiveness and if you have forgiveness in your heart or if you decide you're never going to forgive anybody but i but sometimes i wonder if somebody if you ask them what does that really mean to you uh, if yeah. they could define it and so i thought that was a really important point to make and how does a right. person so sort through it it could be kind of mm-hmm. complicated yeah absolutely and i think that's a lot of the problem with you know people wanting to forgive because it does mean something different to everybody. Kind of like grieving, it means something to it means something different to everybody to grieve. Same thing with doing forgiveness. And you have to follow what's in your heart. And it may not look like somebody else, but you need to determine that for you. And it has to be what it is that will make you your best self. And yeah. it, like I said, it could be, it's totally different for everybody, Yeah, you know, and having, and having the textbook version, I think overwhelms people because that doesn't fit always yeah. to everybody. It, well, exactly. And you hear, you know, the phrase a lot, or you hear, hear people utter a lot, uh, you know, forgive, but never forget. So that makes mm-hmm. that, then you go, okay, what, if you're, if you're not going to forget, which is reasonable, mm-hmm. you're going to remember, but how are you going to frame that memory up? Exactly, right. 
Yes, and I used to say it in the in the way in the context of yeah, I'll forgive, but I never, I won't forget. But I was doing it more in a resentful kind of way, yes. and more of a like, oh, I'm gonna hold this thing over your head, and if things don't go my way, I'm gonna bring it up to you. Yeah, that's not the right way to do it. <laughs> yeah, it's really <laughs> did not that. forgiving. It's that's yeah, it's exactly. really not forgiving when it's that mm-hmm. way. <laughs> Correct. Correct. But you can fool yeah, but, yourself into thinking it is. <laughs> oh, exactly. And, you know, and I think that comes, too, with growth, um, yeah. expansion, spiritual growth, you know, just growing older. You know, it's like it's so exhausting to have forgive. You know, back when I was younger, I could probably hang on to that more. But I can't do that anymore. Mm-hmm. I, I'm just too – it's too It's too much work. And I yes, don't want to do it that. Does. It does. It's, yeah, it's, it's too exhausting. much work. It takes up too much space. Yeah. And absolutely. It, it, it is exhausting. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Who wants to just, uh, it's kind of like um, giving it a lot of prime real estate. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, let's go on to uh, the mm-hmm. fifth phase, which is, or yes. step, uh, choosing gratitude. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, gratitude and appreciation is so vital for us. So, you know, they always say if you're grateful for what you have, you will get more. You know, you have to appreciate what you have or else you're never going to be satisfied with anything. So having the time you had with that person and being grateful for all the lessons and all the things that they gave you, um, whether it was, you know, life lessons, stories, physical things, whatever it is, showing gratitude and appreciation for that person, that they were in your life for that amount of time physically. They're mm-hmm. still in your life. And mm-hmm. show, show gratitude for that because they're still with you, always with you. But some people have that, you know, don't believe that, and that's perfectly fine. But for them, look at what you did have. And with yeah. that person, look at the life lessons that you did and, and be grateful that they were there in your life for as long as they were. Yeah. Even if you, you know, and sometimes I think in, in some of the, you know, worst scenarios or situations that mm-hmm. people go through, you know, finding gratitude towards somebody that was maybe just like, you know, a monster in their life would be insanely yeah. difficult, insanely it difficult. It would be but, difficult. But, but, but even if you... your perspective, yeah. yeah, they've they've taught you things. Yes. You know, and you have to be grateful for that. They told you, they taught you what you don't want in the yes. people in your circle. You know what I mean? So there's always yes. a way to to mm-hmm. look at it from another perspective, for sure. Yeah, totally. I agree. You know, I think that one of the things, and maybe this falls into a little bit of all mm-hmm. the categories, or maybe it falls mainly into the forgiveness category. I'm not sure, but I feel like something that so many of us go through when we lose somebody whether we had a mm-hmm. whether we had the most amazing relationship with that person or a horrible one but i i think right. that guilt is just such a terrible mm-hmm. emotion to yes. be riddled with when we experience the loss of a loved one and right sure. yeah and i i think a lot of us experience some form of it um i'm i'm mm-hmm. actually kind of surprised that guilt isn't one of the stages in that kubler ross model or maybe it's sort of like falls into one of those yeah. categories but you know we we just we go over that shoulda woulda coulda scenario and the stories in our minds and we beat ourselves up in the process and yes. you know we we think our lost loved ones will never know our our true feelings and our regrets mm-hmm. or that now we can, you know, never make it up to them. And that's a really tough one, I think, that we struggle with. So what would you tell people about mm-hmm. what our loved ones who have passed actually really know about maybe our yes. regrets and those feelings? Sure. Of yes. Well, I do believe that when our loved ones have transitioned, that all of that human side of things are gone, obviously. So they yeah. don't, They don't have that. It's all unconditional love. It's all grace. And, you know, it's all these beautiful things that they want for us. Mm -hmm. So, but when we are heavy, when our emotions are heavy and bring us down, we cannot be energetically 
um, vibrate energetically with our vibration higher to, I don't want to say meet them, but you know, when your Mm -hmm. vibration is higher, you're able to receive those messages Mm -hmm. even more. And I do believe that our loved ones do feel the heaviness that we are experiencing. They feel it in a different way, not in the same way that we do, obviously, but I feel like, and maybe it's because they're trying to contact the loved ones Mm -hmm. that are here physically and they're just not able to because of the heaviness. And so I do believe that our loved ones do experience that and they feel that um, because they're trying to connect with us. They want us to know that they are okay because there is no guilt over there. They know that they know that everything that we are experiencing here is as a human existence. It's not our true being. It's not our true self. Mm -hmm. So they understand, they kind of strip away the human side of us and only see our inner soul, which is love, beauty. They see that, but you know, a lot of times, and I was one of them and a lot of my clients do it. They put this armor around it and they put that guilt and they put shame and they put, you know, all of these heavy emotions, anger and depression, all of these things. And so it blocks that soul Mm -hmm. connection that we can maintain with our loved ones. Yeah. And guilt is a huge thing. And I believe it was you at some point, maybe it was when I talked to you prior, but um, Mm -hmm. how you had said something about um, a lot of us do feel that we can control the outcome of somebody's life. And we can't. Yeah, we're not that powerful. We don't have power like that. You know, things that happen in our lives are based on our choices. So things that I've done in my life, it's based on my choices that I've done. And if I if I drink and drive and I get into an accident, well, that was my choice. You know, it had nothing to do with anybody else, even though people would probably say, no, I shouldn't have let them drive. I should have checked on them. They don't have that much power. They yes. Really don't. Yeah. And we don't think about it that way. But and you're right. We we touched True. on it briefly when we first started talking. Mm-hmm. We don't we don't think about it this way, but it really is kind of this arrogance that we have. Like, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm in control of your destiny. Well, yeah. you know, <laughs> not really, yeah. even though not sometimes really. <laughs> circumstances may make it look like that. Right. We, you really right. aren't. Um, you we don't really have aren't. the power we're, we're, to supersede <laughs> the, the creator. Absolutely. And exactly. Exactly. And the only thing we can do is control our lives the best way that we can. But like you said, the creator has that plan for us. And so, you know, my time of death is, I'm sure, determined. I believe that. And I just have to live my life and make the best choices possible. Yeah. So my kids don't have any guilt. And, and the, and the other thing with that too, with people feeling guilty, it's learn from how you feel with them, with the guilt that you're experiencing with them and bring it into your other relationships that you have right here, right now. Now. You yes. Know, it, I yeah. totally agree. And that's really, I think such an important lesson is for for us to understand when we are having all of these feelings about the one that we've lost, not yes. to forget that what we, mm-hmm. you know, a gift that we can take for our own growth and, and our own process moving forward is to make sure that we don't have to, that we can minimize or eliminate those feelings if and when that happens again with someone else that we care about. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's really funny, a really quick story is, when my, my kids, I have four kids. My daughter, Brittany, is 33. I have twins, Jake and Josh, that are 28. And my youngest daughter is 17. But when my boys were younger, I would take them to the babysitter because they were like two, two and a half, three when my sister passed away. Mm-hmm. So when I would take them to the babysitter before school, they were like seven or eight. I could have had the roughest morning with them ever. And mm-hmm. I could have been like, get ready. I got to go to work. You know, that kind of thing as we've yeah. all done. And, um, but as soon as I would drop them off, I'd give them a big hug. I love you so much. I love you. And I would tell people the story. They would laugh at me. And I'm like, no, I don't want the last thing. If that's the last time I see my kids, whether it's me or them, I don't want that to be the last thing that they yeah. remember. Yeah. And so every time I see my kids, my grandkids, 
doesn't matter. I'm always giving them a hug and telling them, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. You know, I give them kisses. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and it's not yep. just that. It's showing every day by your actions. You know, yes. that is a big one, too. I love that. I think you're so yeah. right. So right. Those are just, I think, I just think it's beautiful the way that you've positioned this. And I think it will really be helpful to so many people that, you know, have struggled or are struggling um, with loss. And uh, Mm -hmm. it is, it is a different approach. It is a lighter approach. It's, it's beautiful. And I just think it really would be so helpful if, if, people would be able to be open to this um, just to ease their own suffering and, yes. you know, and help, and help them moving forward. Um, Absolutely. So before I let you go, I, sure. I would, I would love, I know you have, I believe two stops left on your national book tour. I do. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I do. Okay. I'm so excited about it. So in October, starting October 9th, I will be in Phoenix for three or four days or so, five days. Um, and it, that's the first one is going to kick off at Barnes & Noble at Metro Center. And all of this is on my website. And then I will be going to Los Angeles in November. And the first event I have there is on November 20th. And that is at um, Barnes & Noble, Valencia. And, um, and again, all that information is on my website, but yeah, I have, I, I'll be in LA for like five days. So I have different stops there at Barnes and Noble. Um, yeah, just different mystic okay. journeys in, in Venice beach. So yeah, I'm really excited about that. And, Wonderful. Yeah, it, and it's been great. Yeah. That's so, so exciting. exciting. I would imagine yeah. you're getting a lot of interesting feedback from people. I really am. And and that's the thing is I love connecting with people and I love hearing their stories of grief because so many people have been paralyzed by it. And it's heartbreaking to me because I know, I know our loved ones don't want that for us. They Mm -hmm. really, really don't. So, you know, and I know everybody has to do things when they're ready, but I'm hoping and it's my goal that this book and, you know, my website and this book tour, all of these things will help people, will guide them and, you know, help them be, live the best life possible. Yeah. Yes. I I don't know how it can't really, if someone's open and somebody really wants to, yes. uh, you know, yeah. em- embrace um, another way of, of going through this process that we all have to go through in one way, shape or yes. form at some time yep. in our lives. Yep. It's inevitable. Everybody. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So um, where uh, can people mm-hmm. connect with you, your website yeah. and your social media? Mm-hmm. Let us know that real quick. And sure. then I have another yeah, one absolutely. more question for you. Absolutely. So my website is mistymthompson.com. And my Facebook page is, of course, facebook.com, Mystified Enlightenment. And I also have a Facebook group, and they can get information on that on my other Facebook page and my website. But I have a Facebook group that's directed for those who are grieving. It's specific for that. It's called Creating You. And then I have an Instagram account at Misty underscore M underscore Thompson. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Well, this has been just wonderful. And I love your book. And I think it's going to help a lot of people. And Misty, thank you so much for spending this time with us. I really appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. You are so welcome, my dear. We will be in touch. Sounds great. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. I'm really grateful to Misty for spending time with us today and talking through these powerful and positive ways that we can use to help us navigate the grieving process. We have all either been there or we're going to be there at some point. And I think applying Misty's five encouraging phases of grief can really help us ease some of our emotional suffering and help us experience the loss of loved ones in a new and less painful way. So thank you all for hanging out with me today. I know there are endless demands on your time and attention, so please know that I am very grateful that you spent some of your time with me on We're Talking Shift. If you're trying to make some shift happen in your life, you can find out what Private Coaching with Me is all about on LoriBischoff.com. And, of course, you can connect with me 
on any of the social media platforms. So until next week, stay feisty, my friends, and go make some shift happen. That goes for you too, Gary V. The preceding podcast was a TJ DeSantis production. Comments, questions, and inquiries can be directed to desantisprod at gmail.com.